Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to my channel. Today we are doing the strange weird Wikipedia articles iceberg yet again. This week we are doing tier three. We still have four, five, and six tiers I believe. However, those tiers are pretty short. They're a little bit more limited. This one's pretty long. So I may combine four, five, and six into one video, one longer video, or possibly two videos at most, but probably not three more videos because some of the tiers don't have a ton in them. So that being said, these tiers get weird. Like I definitely can tell a difference between tier two and tier three in this one because this one gets pretty dark. This video is sponsored, so I am going to roll to the ad read, and once we're back, we will get right into it. This video is sponsored by Dipsy. Gentle reminders for this new year. Check in with yourself before offering help to someone else. Rest when you need rest and ask for what you need. And say yes to more things that make you feel good. Transport your mind to a world where you can relax and treat yourself to your deepest desires with Dipsy. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. The stories are super immersive with soundscapes and realistic characters. There's stories for everyone's tastes. There's romantic stories stories, adventurous flings on vacation, or hot and heavy hookups. My favorite part about Dipsy is that it is radically inclusive. It has lots of stories for straight listeners, and it also has a lot of stories for the LGBTQ plus community. Plus 56% of the stories are voice acted by people of color. New content on Dipsy is also released every single week. So in between listening to your favorite stories on repeat, there's also always new stuff to explore. Dipsy also offers soothing sleep stories. I love this edition because now I don't need a separate sleep app. They also offer wellness session, sexy stories to read, or ways to connect with your partner. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Hannah. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P sea stories.com slash hannah dipsy stories.com slash hannah okay first on our tier three is the brazen bull don't worry, no bulls are harmed in the making of this one. The brazen bull was from ancient Roman times. So at least this one was from a very long time ago. However, it's still a very creative, messed up torture method and execution method from Roman times. The legend goes that it was a big bronze statue of a bull. It was the same size and form of a real bull, but it was hollow inside and there was a door on one side. So the prisoner who was condemned to torture or death was forced into the bowl and then they were locked in there. There was an acoustic apparatus inside the bowl that would make the person who was screaming inside, it would make their screams convert into bowl sounds, which is just amazing technology, honestly, for that time. It had a system of tubes and stops inside of the head of the bowl to convert the sounds. Once the condemned was inside, Inside the bull and locked in there, they would set a fire underneath. And remember, this bull was made of bronze, so it would slowly heat up, and the person inside would slowly roast to death. The inventor of this device was named Perilos, and he created it for Phalaris. Phalaris was the tyrant of Acragus, Sicily, from the year 570 to 554 BC. Perilos told Phalaris of the invention, his screams will come to you through the pipes as the tenderest, most pathetic, most melodious of bellowings. And he thought that he was going to receive like a ton of recognition and a reward for creating this for Phalaris. But Phalaris was a tyrant and he was instead disgusted by these words. So instead he asked Perios to go into the bull to quote unquote test the sound out for him to make sure it was converting into bull sounds like he said. This was a trick. When he got in the bull, 
Phalaris locked him in there. He lit a fire under him so that he could test the bull sounds for himself and he could hear the very inventor of the bull scream. He didn't kill him. He took him out before he died. But apparently after that, Phalaris took him up to the top of a hill and threw him off anyway. But karma's a bitch and Phalaris himself was killed in the bull. When he was overthrown by Telemachus, this is how they executed him. Those Romans, man, hardcore. Megumi Yokota is next. That is a Japanese name, so I do apologize if I'm mispronouncing it. This one's interesting, not surprising, but I didn't know this. Apparently in the 1970s and 80s, at least 17 Japanese people were abducted by the North Koreans. Megumi was a 13-year-old victim of this. She was kidnapped by a North Korean agent on November 15th, 1977. Here's a photo of her from the wiki page that says it's from 1978. So it's a photo of her a year after her abduction as she was in North Korea. North Korea would later admit to kidnapping Megumi, but they claimed that she passed away while in captivity. However, rightfully so, her parents and most of Japan actually still believe that Megumi is alive and they have never stopped fighting to try to find her and bring her home. So why on earth would North Korea do this other than the simple explanation of it it's North Korea. It's believed as there was North Korean spies in Japan, North Korean agents there, Megumi must have witnessed something that she wasn't supposed to. So they kidnapped her to silence her. In North Korea, she was taught Korean and then she was used as a Japanese tutor for North Korean spies. The rest of the wiki page is very fascinating if you ever have time to go dive into it. There's a lot more details about this case of course, it's a very long wiki page, such as the fact that North Korea apparently sent over a death certificate and Megumi's remains back to Japan, her cremated remains. But there's like all this debate on whether they're real or not. It's thought that this was a fake death certificate and that the remains did not belong to Megumi. But there was all these mistakes during testing. So we really don't know for sure. It's, yeah, it's very fascinating and it goes pretty deep. Next is scafism. Here's another throwback to the do not research iceberg. We talked about this one in there. This is yet another torture execution method that was supposedly used many, many years ago. This one is also called the boats. The victim is trapped between two boats and tied to the boat so they can't escape. They are then covered in milk and honey. They are left out in the water or outside so that they are slowly eaten to death by vermin and insects. This was, of course, ancient. If this was ever truly used, it is definitely not anymore, hopefully. And honestly, given the choice, I think I'd take the brazen bowl. Enhanced interrogation techniques is next. This was during the Iraq war when the US armed forces under the George W. Bush administration tortured detainees that were held by the CIA and the DIA, the Central Intelligence and Defense Intelligence Agencies respectively. They did have prisoners around the world, but the one that you're probably most familiar with here on the news and stuff if you were alive around that time was Guantanamo Bay. Like I said, this was all during the Iraq war following 9-11. But here are all of the things that these detainees would endure. They would be beat. There was tickle torture, binding in contorted stress position, hooding, which is literally just covering the prisoner in a hood for very long periods of time, deafening noises, sleep deprivation until they literally hallucinated, sleep disruption, Options, not giving them food, water, or medical care for their wounds, straight up waterboarding them, walling, which was putting a collar on the person and then using it to slam the person against a wall. There was all kinds of sex crimes, of course, extreme heats or extreme colds, of course, the basics, confinement in claustrophobic places. Some of them 
had enemas forced on them. They would also just endure terrible threats to both their family and children. In 2005, the CIA destroyed videotapes of a lot of these things occurring. They believed that the backlash for destroying the tapes, while it would be bad, it would be nothing compared to if those tapes got leaked to the world and the American public. A lot of people died, of course, as a direct result of the U.S. doing this. And no one has been prosecuted or held responsible for these war crimes, essentially, to this day. And the thing is, I am not, like, um, I don't, I mean, I'm political, but I don't, like, study politics or anything or pay, like, super attention to the news, I know. So I don't have a very good grasp on everything that happened in the Iraq war, so I can't really say either way. But I can say that I do know that torture just generally doesn't work. The person being tortured usually just says whatever you want them to say because they will literally do anything to get it to stop. So they often just lie anyway so it seems way more like this was literally just like revenge like the cia just being you know upset so they use this as an excuse to get back at people like most of these the wiki page is very extensive if you want to read more about this i mean i just want to like tell everybody take like my stuff about this particular topic with the grain of salt actually i mean take everybody's opinion on the internet with the grain of salt but like just understand that i don't understand the politics in war that well. So just as a disclaimer. A merment. I guess this is the torture tier of the wiki. This is yet another ancient method of torture. Don't worry, this whole tier is not about torture methods. There's lots of other stuff. But this is when a person is entombed in an enclosed space with no way of escaping. Sometimes it's a coffin. Sometimes it's a very small brick room sometimes it's like a room room where there's places to walk around in the room but not very much but others are like even smaller than that where the person can barely move if the person was condemned to death they were just simply left in that room to starve to death or you know die from dehydration that's like i mean I think we can all agree that's a pretty brutal torture method. Certain women in the Roman Empire were sometimes condemned to this for breaking their chastity vows. And the other very famous example is that some of the robbers of Persia were also condemned to this. Okay, next is the Pit of Despair. And no, that's actually not a reference to the Princess Bride. Huge warning for this one. This one does involve animals. And if you are sensitive to that, I would definitely advise skipping to the next one. This one I did not personally like reading about. Specifically, baby monkeys. So a lot of us have actually heard of one of these versions of the experiments. If you've ever taken Psych 101, you've probably heard of this guy. That's psychologist Harry Harlow, who would do the experiments on the baby monkeys. As a recap, he would expose baby monkeys who were taken from their mom before they could bond with their mom, and they would expose them to a wire type thing that was supposed to be this surrogate mother, and then also a another object that was like covered in cloth and more comforting. The baby monkey would always seem to go towards the cloth mother. Even when the wire monkey had food, had a bottle of food, the baby monkey would go feed off of that mother, but then would run back to the cloth mother. And this basically proved that social beings value comfort over necessities. Now, that's what we usually learn in Psych 101, but what's not talked about is how like actually evil Harry Harlow was. In that very same experiment, he would sometimes expose the monkeys to quote unquote abusive fake mothers. So the surrogate wire mothers would sometimes like burst cold air at them or even poke them with spikes. Like he was really mean, but it gets worse. Harry Harlow's wife dies during his research and he became extremely depressed and isolated like anybody would. So he took these baby monkeys, these poor little innocent baby monkeys, and he decided that he wanted to do depression experiments on them instead. So in the 1970s at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he created what 
others called a vertical chamber apparatus, but Harry Harlow preferred to call it the quote-unquote pit of despair. Now, he specifically used rhesus macaque monkeys, and seriously, like, he doesn't physically hurt them, but this is, it's almost worse. Like, this is so heartbreaking. So again, giving you another chance to skip to the next one. Harlow would take these baby macaques um, anywhere from three days to three months old. He would make sure they had already bonded with their mothers. And he would take them from his mothers and put them in this vertical apparatus chamber thing and leave them there for up to 10 weeks. They were not exposed to the outside world. They were given food and water pretty much, and that's it. He found that when he raised one of the doors of the chamber to take a look at the little baby monkey, it was huddled in the corner and stopped moving pretty much. It became so depressed. Now, I don't really have to say this, but obviously this is appalling and very unethical. Thankfully, it wasn't like nobody batted an eye. Most of Harry Harlow's colleagues like super condemned him for this. Not to mention the public was not happy about it either. The biggest criticism was that this wasn't really an experiment. We already know what would happen if we cut off a social creature from its mother and other social beings like that, as he already proved with the cloth mothers, we find comfort in others. Like, what was he trying to prove? Because we already knew what was going to happen. It was a really dumb, pointless experiment and put so much emotional damage on monkeys, which are, as we know, very close to humans. Others who knew Harlow said that he enjoyed getting a rise out of people. And this is kind of evident by the fact that he insisted on calling it the pit of despair when his colleagues wanted to call it a vertical chamber apparatus instead, because the pit of despair is just like trying to make drama and get people angry. Basically, Harlow was super depressed himself, so he wanted to conflict this depression on others in the guise of research to make himself feel better for some reason because he's a sociopath. I don't know. I seriously hate this man so much. I don't understand how you can lack such basic empathy. And not to mention the experiment did nothing for science. Anyway, okay, next is beheading video. Um, sorry if you skipped the last one. This one is also pretty disturbing, just FYI. It's exactly what it sounds like, and we've talked about it on this channel before. These videos are made as a form of propaganda. It's a video of a hostage being graphically, slowly, and very violently some of these videos that have leaked have, of course, been made by the Mexican cartel. But I think this method and this thing has been most closely associated with ISIS. These videos are then shared online and spread on shock websites. The wiki page is extra disturbing because it has a list of the known videos of this that have been released over the internet over the years. So go with caution. I am not going to go into those right now because YouTube's going to get really mad at me if I do. Castrato is next. Castrato does not happen anymore, thankfully. But this was a very popular thing in the 18th century where a very young boy, prepubescent boy, would be essentially castrated so that their singing voice would stay high-pitched. This, of course, was for singing and opera purposes. Famously, we have the last Sistine Castrato named Alessandro Moreschi. He retired from singing in 1913 and he passed away in 1922, but he was the only Castrato that made solo recordings of his singing. And these are the only known recordings of a castrato singing that exists. So here's a little clip of that.
List of unexplained sounds. List of unexplained sounds. This one is so fascinating to me. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a list of sounds that are unidentified or formally unidentified. These are all captured by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, aka the NOAA. All the clips on the Wikipedia page have been sped up quite a bit so that you can actually hear something. So let's listen to a couple of them, shall we? Here is one called Unsweep. You might need headphones for this. So the NOAA believes that this sound may be underwater volcanic activity, but it remains unidentified. We don't know for sure. It was recorded between New Zealand and South America in August of 1991. Here is one called Whistle. This one is from the Eastern Pacific on July 7th, 1997, and was recorded on a hydrophone. That one is also yet to be identified. And then there's several on this wiki page that have been identified, but originally they were unidentified. So here's train. This one was taken on March 5th, 1997. According to the NOAA, this sound was most likely an iceberg grounding on the Ross Sea near Cape Adair. I'm sorry, what? We all know that the ocean is like very unexplored. Like we don't really know what's down there because we can't explore all of it. So this is just so cool to me that we detect these sounds that have like not been heard by anybody. Fatal familial insomnia, also commonly referred to as simply fatal insomnia. This is an extremely rare genetic disorder and also a disease. When someone has insomnia that is so severe, they will pass away from it. The person starts out just simply having trouble sleeping, but it gradually gets worse. The person will pass away a few months later to a few years later, and there is no known cure. The disease has four stages. The first stage starts with worsening insomnia, which leads to panic attacks, paranoia, and phobias. It's estimated to last about four months. Stage two is hallucinations, and that lasts for about five months. Stage three is complete inability to sleep, followed by rapid weight loss for about three months. Stage four is straight up dementia. Over about six months, the person becomes unresponsive and mute and then will pass away soon after that. As it gets worse, the person will also end up in this pre-sleep state, like basically all the time. You know that feeling you get when you're about to fall asleep, but you're technically still awake? I call it being like on the boat, like you're about to sail out to sea and you're on the boat, you've boarded the boat. That's what I personally call it. It's kind of like being in that state, except 
all the time. You don't actually fall asleep. The average person with this will survive 18 months. However, it can be anywhere from six months to six years. Like I said, this is incurable and it's actually pretty confusing based on my research on it. There are, of course, you'd think like just medications, like just sedate the person, just force them to go to sleep. And there are medications, very, very, very strong dangerous insomnia medications that they can give the patient to help them sleep and it can like prolong their life but it eventually it doesn't work long term now from my understanding of this it's a prion disease that causes this insomnia it's not just a severe lack of sleep a prion disease are i mean it's probably prion diseases are the scariest diseases i think ever but a good example of a prion disease is mad cow disease most of us have heard of that this means that yes a According to my research, fatal insomnia is transmissible. It's not really contagious, like you can't get it from hugging or being around a person or kissing them or anything like that. The brain matter would have to be transferred to another person. So you would have to essentially eat parts of their brains or be injected with parts of the infected brain tissue. I really want to do a video about Ricard Saigon someday, even though there's been quite a few videos about him already, but he had fatal insomnia and he actually documented his journey with it on YouTube. I also, again, want to stress that I am not a medical person. I am by no means an expert, so please like, don't take this little paragraph about fatal insomnia as like you know about it now please like go do your own research on it because this is just based off the wikipedia page and then some other medical articles about it so i just like i don't want people to think that i'm an expert on stuff just because i'm a youtuber so stone man syndrome this is another one we've discussed in the past this is also a very scary disease Stone man syndrome or fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva is another very rare disease where all your connective tissues, such as your muscles, tendons, and ligaments, all just turn into bone. It's the only known disease where one organ literally turns into another organ. And also for this one, there's no cure and not really any good treatments. It's extra scary because they have tried surgeries to remove some of the bone in people that have this to basically like make them more comfortable to help them with the pain and to hopefully make the disease slow down. But they found that removing any of the bone makes the body like repairs it with bone in a even more rapid pace. So surgery actually hurts rather than helps. If you can get proper treatment and a proper early diagnosis, the prognosis is around 40 years old for this disease. A lot of more. This is also known as terror famine or the great famine. This was a man-made famine in the Soviet Union from 1932 to 1933. It killed millions of Ukrainian people. And it was pretty much a genocide by the Soviet Union, aka the leader being Joseph Stalin, heard of him. They wanted to stop Ukrainian resistance and they obviously did not want Ukraine to become an independent state. The wiki page gets extra dark because during the Holodomor, a lot of Ukrainians were then uh, charged and convicted of cannibalism because they were obviously very desperate. So something that the Soviet Union imposed on them, the man-made famine, and then they were subsequently punished for resorting to cannibalism. Yeah, you know. Do you ever have a really hard time like losing your faith in humanity? Like, Jesus. Green boots. Now, this is a very famous photo, and unfortunately I can't show it to you because it's of a dead body. However, it's a very fascinating photo. It's not graphic or anything like that. It is a little upsetting because it is of a dead body, and to think about how this person died is pretty um, harrowing, but I do recommend going to see it. It's very readily available. Just look up Green Boots on Google if you would like to see it. Green Boots is the name of an unidentified hiker on Mount Everest who passed away during his trek. 
he passed away like in the path of other hikers. So he literally became a landmark. Specifically, he was on the main Northeast Ridge route on Mount Everest. So everybody for a time that was climbing Mount Everest would like run into green boots and they knew they would. And it was like a landmark. It was a thing that you saw on your way up. Obviously, as the name suggests, the man was wearing bright green boots and he's located at about 27,900 feet up. However, he was moved in 2014. A group of Chinese climbers actually moved his body to be a little more inconspicuous, a little less like right out in the open. I think they were just trying to like show respect because he was so like in the path. Most believe that Green Boots is an Indian climber by the name of of Seswan Palajor, probably saying that wrong. He died on his expedition in 1996. Now, Mount Everest has takes a lot of victims. A lot of people die trying to climb Mount Everest. There's an estimated probably 200 bodies on Mount Everest just resting there. It's simply too dangerous to go and recover them and try to take them back to their loved ones. And then, like I said, I mean, not just green boots, but a lot of bodies other climbers on Mount Everest, you pretty much, they all expect to see at least one or two dead bodies on their way up. Honestly, I mean, it is sad, but it's also like they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew the risks. This is like one of the most dangerous mountains that you can climb. And I think if you love Everest enough to risk your life to go climb it, I think most of the hikers are willing to have that be their final resting place. To them, it's probably a beautiful thing. At least their families know where they are. I mean, list of hazing deaths in the U.S. So we all know what hazing is, right? right? It's a sort of initiation that usually aims to humiliate or degrade a person before they are able or worthy to enter a certain group. It's often associated with fraternities and universities in general. There's a wiki page out there that has a list of all the known deaths that have been attributed to hazing. Now, the top of the list does have a caveat that this is probably not a comprehensive list. There is probably others that just have not been attributed to hazing, even though they might have been involved hazing, just FYI. I'm going to read a few of these so that you can get an idea. It's a very long list, but I'll read a few of them for you. October 17th, 1899, a man named Edward Fairchild Berkeley at Cornell University. Berkeley was attempting to pin a piece of paper to a tree or bridge accounts vary, when he fell into a canal and drowned. Members insisted that the errand was not a form of hazing and was merely meant to keep him occupied until his formal initiation later that day. November 8th, 1903, Martin Lowe at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, shortly after being initiated into Phi Tsai Chi, German-born Lowe was found deceased in his dorm room while his South African roommate was found unconscious. Upon awakening, Lowe's roommate described the hazing. A week prior, Lowe was undressed, blindfolded, and taken into a room where he was laid on a block of ice. He was then carried upstairs to a balcony and thrown over the railing, a drop of 24 feet. Underneath the railing were students holding a sheet, though, to catch his fall. But when he fell onto the sheet, he was tossed up and down until he was literally unconscious. After reviving, he was beaten severely. He was given whiskey and kawanine, a malaria drug, that evening. The following Saturday, he submitted to an unknown form of hazing, and his roommate underwent the same hazing ritual that Lowe underwent the weekend prior. September 17th, 1959, Richard Swanson at the University of Southern California. Kappa Sigma pledges were told to swallow a quarter pound piece of raw liver soaked in oil without chewing. The meat, of course, lodged in Swanson's throat and he began choking. The fraternity brothers did not tell police and ambulance workers about the hazing ritual and instead attributed Swanson's respiratory distress to a quote-unquote nervous spasm. He died two hours later. The incident inspired the 1977 film Fraternity Row as well as CSI crime scene investigation episode titled Pledging Mr. Johnson. March 15th, 
15, 1999, Stephen Petz at Ferris State University. Petz died of alcohol intoxication after drinking heavily as part of his initiation. On the night prior to his death, he played a game called The Wheel of Torture. Petz's mother explained, they sat in a circle and would spin the wheel. And when it was your turn to spin, you had to drink what the wheel said. Petz consumed 27 shots of liquor and passed out. He was found in serious condition at 8 a.m. the next morning. His fraternity brothers drove him to the hospital an hour later. November 12th, 2018, Colin Wyant at Ohio University. Colin, a freshman at Ohio University, died of asphyxiation due to nitrous oxide ingestion from whipped cream chargers, an alleged part of a hazing practice involving sleep deprivation, physical beating, and the forced ingestion of alcohol and drugs. Like I said, this list is way longer than this if you're interested in going to read more. The overwhelming theme that I didn't really get into because it was very, very common on a lot of them, I only kind of got into that in one of them, is, is that alcohol poisoning seems to be a theme in a lot of these tragedies. Nutty Putty Cave is next. So so Nutty Putty Cave is a cave, obviously. Specifically, it's a hydrothermal cave that's located in Utah Lake, Utah. The cave is known for having very narrow passageways, and it also has this soft putty-like mud throughout it, hence Nutty Putty Cave. This cave is on this list because it's most well known for having a body forever stuck inside of it. On November 24th, 2009, 26-year-old John Edward Jones was exploring the cave with his brother and mistook a small tunnel as the passageway called the birth canal, but it was not the birth canal. It was a place too small for anybody to go in and he got stuck inside of it upside down and his body was also stuck and bent in a way that caused him serious harm every time he tried to move. Rescue crews did come and try to save John, of course, and they worked really hard. They did everything they could, but they just couldn't get him out. John was stuck in there in that position for 28 hours before he finally passed away due to cardiac arrest. The strain on his body from being in that position for so long was simply too much. And then they had to leave John's body in there because it was simply too dangerous for anyone to try to remove it. So it was finally agreed that they had to leave John's body in there and that Nutty Putty Cave would be his final resting place. They used explosives to close the ceiling of the cave and they used concrete to seal up the entrance. So in 2009, when John died, that was the last of Nutty Putty Cave. Nobody is allowed to go in there anymore and it's literally impossible to go in there anymore. The cave has of course also been memorialized for John. Little Albert Experiments. I've talked about this one in my Can't Look Away series, actually. A lot of repeats on this iceberg tier. I think that just goes with a lot of the topics I talk about on this channel just end up being on these icebergs. But let's talk about it anyway. This is another psychology experiment. In my opinion, nowhere near as bad as the monkey one. But the experiment was done by John B. Watson and his grad student assistant named Rosalie Rayner at the John Hopkins University, which as we know is also a hospital. The results of their findings were published in February of 1920. It was a classical conditioning experiment where John B. Watson and Rosalie Rayner took a baby. In this case, his name was Albert. That's not his real name. He was plucked out of the hospital there to do experiments on. There's a big debate on whether his mother knew about this or not. And if she did, she was likely coerced, etc. But they did this experiment on him where they would give him a lab rat and little baby Albert was encouraged to play with the rat. But while he was playing with it, Watson and Rayner would suddenly scare Albert. So they would come up behind him and make a huge banging noise like with metal on metal. And not surprisingly, Albert started crying and would try to get away. They wanted to see if they could classically condition 
him into being afraid of rats by scaring him while he was playing with the rats. And in this experiment, yes. But then they found that Albert had this generalized fear, not only to rats, but other furry objects. They would present him with a rabbit, a furry dog, a Santa Claus mask, and many other objects. Albert, at least for a short time, would also present fear response to those objects associating the rat and fuzzy objects with that sound and being startled. Obviously, this experiment would be considered just very unethical now. Legally, we would never do this today. But the other important thing to note is that it was just like very objectively speaking, a very bad experiment. They didn't have a control group and they only had one subject, which just makes for kind of a bad experiment, which... It's just kind of Albert going through this emotional distress for no reason. Leica, I think is how it's pronounced. This one, again, feel free to skip to the next one if you don't want to hear it. The dog does die, but it's also like part of our history. Like this one's definitely hard to avoid in regular day life because if you ever visit a space museum or learn about space at all, you're going to learn about Leica and dogs like Leica. So when we were first trying to get people into space, of course, we used animals to test it out. Leica was a dog from Russia. And yes, the US did these things with animals as well. Leica was a Soviet space dog. She was one of the first living creatures to orbit the Earth. But of course, as expected, and they never expected anything else, she didn't make it back. She passed away while in space. I am so super against this. I just think this is a really messed up part of our history. And I know it's too late. I know it happened decades ago, but there is something about this particular one that bothers me more than all the other unethical things that the human race has done. <laughs> I don't know. I just hate how humans use animals for shit that we don't want to do. Like animal testing, for example, I understand like, no, I wouldn't want to take a medication or a vaccine that hasn't been tested on animals. Like that's terrible to say, but it's true. Anybody who's ever taken Tylenol, even if you're vegan, that Tylenol was originally tested on animals. Like, you know, there's, I get it. Cosmetics, of course, I don't think should be tested on animals. I think there's plenty of humans that would be willing to take the pretty low risk of getting a rash by testing out cosmetics. I think that's ridiculous. This to me, it just seems so wrong. I believe we used monkeys too to send them into space and all these animals died because of the space race and humans wanting to do something. Like, I don't, it's just so gross to me. That poor dog, all I can think about is how distressed that dog must have been. And I mean, I, I know this is a morally gray area because like I'm not vegan or anything like that. I eat meat and I personally see it as a personal choice of at least we are doing it for a purpose to stay alive. That doesn't mean I'm ignorant to the meat industry, but a sacrifice in the name of science like this, I, I don't know. I guess it's for me, I think it's because I have a hard time believing there was nobody in Russia and nobody in the U.S that would be willing to potentially sacrifice their life in the name of science to do this, to be the first person to go up in space. I just have a hard time believing there was nobody in the world that would be willing to do this. Knowing the things that I know people are willing to do and risk their life for, it just, that's, I think that's why I find it so gross is to just use poor innocent animals as like a way to be smarter than another country. Okay, sorry, that was a tangent. That was a rant. We're going to move on to the next one, which is Terrare. Again, I'm so sorry. So many of these are technically repeats, but if you haven't watched all my other videos, maybe you've never heard of this. Terrare, we've talked about several times. He was also on the Do Not Research iceberg. This is from the late 1700s. Terrari was a French showman and he had a very unusual appetite. He would eat just enormous amounts and never be full. Like he could eat 15 portions worth of banquet size meals and he still would never be satisfied. So he was pretty well known for being able to eat just 
weird things then. He kind of started to make money off the fact that he could eat corks, he could eat stones, he could and did eat live animals. And he was even suspected at one point to have eaten a 14 month old child. I'm not kidding. The full story of this one is pretty gnarly. There's a lot of videos on him as well. And the full story is so bizarre. And I I think it's a pretty well-documented case that we know to be true, which is very interesting to me as well, because this kind of thing, uh, as far as I know, hasn't happened since. And it just seems impossible. Dyatlov Pass incident, yet another one that has been covered extensively on many, many channels. I actually have a criticism of this iceberg to whoever made it because I personally think this one should be in like tier one. This is one that I think by now everybody has heard of this. I have to respectfully disagree by it being all the way down in tier three. But anyway, I'm just going to roughly go over it because again, I think most of you know what this is. The Sparks Note version is that in 1959, nine Russian hikers disappeared after going on an expedition at Dyatlov Pass. They all died under very strange circumstances. However, this case has been deemed solved in recent years, although conspiracy theorists, of course, do not believe that it's actually been solved. But most likely it was an avalanche or something that the group thought was an avalanche. It's a fascinating case mostly because the nine, they had radiation on their clothing, which was really weird. And the group of nine were not found together. They were found in separate areas in small groups. Yeah, like I said, there's so many details. It's it's an hour video on its own, and I'm sure most of you have heard of it. Mystery of Celtic Wood. This was a strange disappearance of 71 Australian soldiers in the 10th Battalion during an attack on Germans during World War I in October of 1917. They disappeared literally without a trace. 71 soldiers together. There were rumors that it was some sort of paranormal thing, that they simply walked into the mist together and disappeared off the face of the planet. But if you go to the area, the guides there will insist that the men were simply massacred, likely by the Germans, and buried in a mass grave underground that we've never been able to find. Misreporting, though, and clerical errors are most likely part of the explanation one way or another. It's considered the biggest mystery of Australia's Great War. Travis the Chimp, one of my most viewed videos goes into this case and the disturbing 911 call that it involves. I'll try to remember to link it down below if you want to watch that video. But Travis was a chimp who was purchased by Sandra and Jerome Harold for $50,000 from a breeder after Travis had been taken from his mother at three days old, which that in itself, like, I don't think I have to tell you that that is so wrong to basically purchase a chimp, for lack of a better word, on like the black market, I would argue, since poor little Travis was taken from his mom. Anyway, they raised Travis literally like their human child. He was very well known in his town and was pretty much part of his community. They'd have him sit at the dinner table with them. He could drink wine from a glass. He would watch TV. He could dress himself amongst many, many other things. Sandra's husband passed away from cancer in 2004, and Sandra and Jerome's only child passed away in a car accident in 2000. So after 2004, it was just Sandra and Travis. They would literally sleep and bathe together. But on February 16th, 2009, Sandra's 55-year-old friend, Charla Nash, was attacked by Travis while she was visiting one day. Travis effectively ripped her entire face off. She came over to help Sandra because Travis had stolen Sandra's keys and ran out of the house and wouldn't come back in. So Charla came over to help wrangle Travis back into the house. Charla was holding a Tickle Me Elmo. I believe she had brought Travis a new Tickle Me Elmo or it was his toy that she was holding. I don't know exactly which one, but this was Travis's absolute favorite toy. And when he saw Charla holding it, he went into a rage, basically like thinking she was trying to take it from him or steal it from him. Travis was pretty severely overweight. And as we know, chimps that are not overweight are 
incredibly strong, stronger than any human. They are like absolute forces of nature. Like I think I would compare it to a grizzly bear that they are that freaking strong and can be pretty vicious. And he just attacked Charla. He can't be blamed for it. He it was an animal that was stolen, kidnapped by humans, and never should have been there in the first place. Sandra tried to stop Travis with every means that she could, but she could not stop him. He was too strong. She thought Charla was dead, so she ran out, hid in her car to call 911. Like I said in my original full-length video about this, I play the 911 call in that video. Officers showed up. Travis was able to get into one of the officer's cars, and he was trying to attack the officer. So the officer was forced to shoot Travis four times. Travis finally retreated and he was found passed away near his cage. Like he was trying to get back into his bed. Charla Nash actually survived. She's had a ton of reconstructive surgery. She's completely blind. Like her eyes are completely fake now, but she is alive and still alive. And still, I mean, I think she has a pretty hard life being so disabled. But as far as I know, she is doing okay. 15 months after the attack, Sandra passes away at 72 from an aneurysm. I go into my opinions about it in the other video, but most of you could probably predict my feelings on it. I think this is completely 1000% Sandra and Jerome, if he was still alive's fault. They should have never had Travis in the first place. And to underestimate an animal like this that has never been domesticated is just negligent beyond belief and selfish and terrible. Like, I have no... I, I have a hard time having any sympathy for them because they kidnapped this chimp. This chimp was just acting on its nature and we cannot expect chimps to have the control that humans have. 2016 clown incident. Okay, I'm sorry, but I also made a full video about this one. There's a lot on this wiki page. I don't think the rest of the tiers are like this where I have already talked about a lot of these things and I promise this is the last one for this tier that I've already done. And my full video on this, I just rewatched it recently. Shout out to my crazy bad eyeshadow in that video. But other than that, my video is very good. I did a really good video on creepy clowns in general, but this one's very creepy. Basically in 2016, there was a series of people dressed in very creepy clown costumes that were loitering near forest schools and other public areas simply to freak people out. There was a rumor at one point that these clowns were trying to lure children into the woods, but that was uncovered as a hoax as there was absolutely no proof that there was any threat to the public or that any children were ever actually lured by a clown. A lot of these stunts were actually just people that were extremely excited and showing their support for the 2017 adaptation of Stephen King's It that was going to come out soon. A lot of other people were setting up these videos as this was kind of a clown craze going on at the time. So a lot of other people were just setting up the videos to go viral on TikTok. And in my full video, I actually go into how this has actually been happening for decades. Like, interestingly, this is actually nothing new. Next is The Anguished Man. This one I had never heard of. This one is so creepy and disturbing. The Anguished Man is the name of a painting, but interestingly, the artist of this painting is unknown. A man from England named Sean Robinson is the owner of the painting, and he claims to have inherited it from his grandmother. His grandmother told Sean that the original artist used his own blood mixed with the paint in order to produce this painting. And not only that, but shortly after completing the painting, the original artist passed away from S-word. So of course, the painting is allegedly haunted. Sean has a YouTube channel about the painting and he posted many years ago some videos of the painting. He's supposedly showing paranormal 
activity. He claims that he's heard crying and moaning in his home and that once he saw the figure of a man. Whether you believe in ghosts or not, I think we can all agree that this painting is super creepy on its own, whether it's haunted or not. The Donner Party is next. For those of you that don't know, the Donner Party was a group of American pioneers that traveled by wagon from the Midwest to California. Think Oregon Trail that we used to all play in elementary school, or at least I did. They had this series of very unfortunate events that led them to be stuck in a winter storm in the winter of 1846 through 1847, and they were stuck in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Because of the awful conditions they were in and their lack of food, it is reported that some of the migrants had to resort to cannibalism to survive the harsh winter after some of their people passed away from starvation, cold, or sickness. It's nothing anybody wanted to do. They simply had absolutely no other options. There were 87 members of the Donner Party that set out in the beginning for California, and only 48 of them made it there. Last on tier three is MK Ultra. MK Ultra is one of those things that sounds like a very outlandish conspiracy theory that could not possibly be true, but it's one of the conspiracy theories that is 1000% true and really happened. MK Ultra was a human experimentation program designed and done by the United States CIA and began in 1953, but didn't end until 1973. In layman's terms, it's often referred to as CIA's mind control program. They would use drugs, most commonly LSD. However, they did use other drugs and they would dose the subject with the drugs without their consent and without them knowing. They also used electroshock, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual and also just other random forms of torture to see if they could literally brainwash their subject. They wanted to study this mind control as a way to recognize it. They wanted to be able to understand mind control and how it's done in case they needed to use it against the USSR. America was super duper scared of communism at this time and basically worried that people were becoming brainwashed and that the USSR was planting spies in the US, brainwashed spies. And they wanted to learn how they were brainwashed so that they could basically use it against them or at least recognize when there was a spy. Like most of these things, it's obviously way more complicated than that, but that's the basic just very disturbing that this is actually something that we did. And as you can imagine, terrible things went on. Fun fact though, Robert Hunter was one of the people that was experimented on. I think he volunteered for it though in the early stages, as well as Ken Kesey, Ken Kenzie, I think his name is, who wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And Robert Hunter is a huge uh, songwriter for The Grateful Dead, which is my favorite band. So, okay, that is going to be it for tier three. Don't forget to check out Dipsy, our wonderful sponsor for today. And also please just like the video if you could. It helps me out a lot. Thanks to all our patrons on the screen. Top tiers are Colin Holmes, The Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Tom L, Little Kittle Cat, Mitchell Schaefer Meyer, Mike, Alice Paul, Brittany Phillips, Willow Winchester, Bambi, Momo Neon, Philip J, Marita 144, Sage K, Elderly Hipster, Reese Rolls, The Puppy Hag, Rebecca Jackson, Headless Fancy, Toby, Carter, Kawakan Anime and Gaming Convention, Sonder, Sarah the Crazy Fish Lady, Blood for the Koi, Larkrar, Maxi, Ashley Danielle, Ellison Luna, Julieta, Cece Picard, Sophia Wood, A Bunny Apparently, Leon Vanek, and Destiny Riley. 